Namaskar and welcome to Facts and Figures friends. The topic for today is voyage. So much has been written about voyages that the Europeans undertook long back, say the 16th century, especially towards Asia with India and China in mind. In this context, let me describe one such voyage to you. European affinity for India had grown from medieval times and for compelling trade links. But it was only around 1600 when the East India Company was formed in London that the concept of organized trade voyages to the Indian Ocean started gaining grounds. In 1583, a group of Englishmen sailed from Falmouth, a town and port on the River Fall on the south coast of Cornwall, England, United Kingdom on a ship named Tiger that was bound for uh, West Asia. This group included local businessmen John Newberry, John Eldred and Ralph Fitch. It also carried a jeweller by the name of William Leeds and a painter called uh, James Story. merchant explorer who had two years before undertaking a daring overland trip to Hormuz in the Persian Gulf and back, picking up Arabic on the way. Fitch was a leather merchant and perhaps the most senior member of the party. Eldred was a 31-year-old trader in Levantine silks, which was from East Mediterranean. The trio Newberry, Fitch and Eldred had been close to the shareholders of the English Levant Company. Now these shareholders partly sponsored the expedition. The company had been doing business in Constantinople, also known as Istanbul, for some years now and even brought back samples of cotton cloth from India, silks from China and spices from the Indonesian archipelago. The goal of the expedition was to explore a way to reach the original sources of these goods. The party reached Tripoli in Syria, crossed the Lebanese mountains to reach Aleppo in present-day Syria and from there they sailed to Euphrates, a river in southwest Asia rising in eastern Turkey and flowing south across Syria and Iraq to join the Greek river Tigris to Al Fallujah. Al Fallujah is a city in the Iraqi province of uh, Al Anbar, located roughly 69 kilometers west of Baghdad on the Euphrates. At this point, Eldred stayed on to trade in spices and the rest of the group journeyed on to reach Hormuz. Hormuz belonged to the Persian Empire but in practice the Portuguese practically ruled this port so vital to their uh, policy of blockading the Indian Ocean routes to all but friendly ships. Their friends, the Venetian merchants from Venice, did not want English merchants in West Asia. Not surprisingly, they were promptly arrested at Hormuz. The Portuguese chief justice gave a judgment that they were spies, ignoring the letters of introduction that they were carrying from Queen Elizabeth I, addressed to the emperors of India and China. The party was sent on a Portuguese galleon. Galleon is a sailing ship in use, especially by Spain, from the 15th to the 18th centuries, originally a warship, later converted into a mercantile ship. To Goa to be interrogated by the Viceroy Don Francisco de Mascaranas, they were sent to captivity and were released after 13 days. Once freed, the party lost no time setting up business in Goa. However, the Jesuits kept the pressure on them to convert to Catholicism and allegedly hatched a plot to get them re-arrested. Fearing further trouble, the party escaped Goa late in 1854. The group then traveled to Belgaum overland. From there, they went to Bijapur, Burhanpur, Mandu and Ujjain. A few miles before Ujjain, the group came across a resplendent procession of Emperor Akbar. Early the following year, the group reached Agra. Although the party appeared to have been well received by Akbar's court, it is not known if any of these men actually met the emperor to deliver the letter of the queen to him. The group now divided itself. Fitch was to travel to Bengal. Newberry was to go to England by the land route and return with a ship to Bengal and meet Flitch there. So that was the kind of planning. Newberry did set out 
on the journey but was not heard of again. Lee took up service with the Mughal court and never ever returned to England. The others moved on to Bengal, the legendary land that supplied so many finely woven cloths to the markets of East and West Asia. From Agra, Fitch went to Banaras, the Bengal port of Saptagram, colloquially called Satgaon, and navigated through the treacherous waters of the Sundarbans to reach Bakla. Since he does not mention about the land journey or about changing the ship, it will be safe to assume that the town and kingdom of Bakla were located somewhere on the lower Meghna River or one of its tributaries, possibly the Tentulia. The Aine Akbari of Abul Fazal, the Mughal court officer and chronicler, mentioned some years after Fitch visited the place that the town was destroyed by a giant tidal wave from the sea, taking 200,000 lives with it. Bakla reappeared as a Mughal Zamindari, an estate uh, run by tax-collecting landlord, or you can say a Zamindar, but on a different and safer location. From old Bakla, Fitch travelled to Sripur and Sonargaon, two mid-side kingdoms of the lower Bengal Delta. He carefully noted all tradable goods to be found in India, from the pepper of Cochin to cloves of Malukas, a group of islands in eastern Indonesia between Celebs and New Guinea, settled by the Portuguese but taken over by the Dutch who made them the center for spice monopoly and at that time they were known as Spice Islands. Fitch also discovered the diamonds of Golconda rubies of Pegu, that is Myanmar, to the great store of cotton cloth from Bengal and rice from where they served All India, Ceylon, Pegu, Malacca, Sumatra and many other places. From Pegu, Fitch sailed for England where he reached in April 1591. Master Ralph Fitch, one of the minor members of the party, became the most famous among them when the records of the travel appeared in print. This was the first travelogue of India by an Englishman. Fitch became a hero. The point to be noted is that the expedition did not achieve anything very great in terms of serving the trade directly, but it sowed the seeds for the concept that a trade treaty between two kingdoms, that is Mughal India and Tudor England, is possible. This objective was better served some decades later by means of an organized body of merchants and a united company. So friends, uh, this is how these Europeans, they traveled and went to various parts in the, in the globe, I would say. So that's all for today. Maybe I'll tell you something more about these voyages in my next episodes. Till then, goodbye and see you next week.